Hey everyone, good morning. We are live for our Wednesday Wake Up Morning Show where the Teach Better team gets to go live every single Wednesday to kick off midweek excitement talk shop about new ideas and just, you know, be maybe some little bit of a break in humor and <laughs> the fun in our week. We have Dave Schmidt with us, which I know many of you are just going to be geeking out about because him and I have not been able to be live together on the Wednesday Wake Up in forever. So expect some fun details from the Teach Better team and also obviously some good conversation as we get into our discussion today. If you are in the comments as we stream on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and LinkedIn, feel free to uh, comment to us. We always love to see you saying good morning and interacting with each other. And then if you're catching this, by the way, on the Teach Better Talk podcast, Thank you for being there. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. We always appreciate that. Dave's got a podcast too. So if you could like pause this, go over there, rate and review his podcast. Like we can get this all done in one big swoop. We'll be right back. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We are live for the Wednesday Wake Up Morning Show, and we are so thrilled to be here bright and early for all of you as we head into what I think, I mean, geez, it's like the last week of March. Hi, Dave. Good morning. Good morning, and good morning to anybody that's down here on spring break. I feel like all of America is hanging out in my front yard right now, so good morning, everybody. I mean, Dave, I'm not trying to sound creepy, but I would totally come to Florida, hang out with you. And it's specifically in your front yard. I think that's the way to go. So, so Ray, not to, to guilt you, but Joshua Stamper's been here. Katie Miglin's been here. Yeah. Brianna Shaner's been here. Ray Hewitt has not been here. I know. I know. This needs to be a thing. I won't lie. I don't know that Florida was very high on my list to visit. Like, there's just so many places to go. Yeah, and no, hold been... on. That was past tense. Was very high. Yeah. No, truly. And then, then then you moved there, and I'm like, okay, now it's, like, creeping up. So I, I really would like to take a trip specifically so I can take a selfie in your front yard. I, well, I feel like I need to move to France just so I can have a chance of maybe seeing Ray Hewitt again someday. Oh, my God, Dave. I just booked a trip to France. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Do you want to come? You could, like, carry my bags. <laughs> we could, like, tag team this. Like, I'll come hang out in your front yard. You could come with me to France. This could just be wonderful. Well, or we could just hang out. I don't know why I got to be the guy carrying your bags, but yeah, okay. That's, that's true. I also shouldn't be the creeper hanging on your front yard. That's probably not appropriate. <laughs> but I, I, somebody needs to mow the yard. I mean, feel free. Oh, I could probably help you find someone to do that. <laughs> well, speaking of, I, I was just um, on a call yesterday afternoon with somebody in, they, they said the far south Chicago. I didn't know far south Chicago, if that was a thing, but in Chicago I mean, land. And they were talking about how stinking cold it was. Like it was 27 degrees or something yesterday. It just sounds yeah. so, so crazy to me. Is it really cold there right now? It's very cold. And I will say, I would love to tell you, well, yesterday was so nice. It was high forties. Today is high twenties. So yeah, we're not bringing the positivity here in the weather front. Let me tell you. Okay. Well, but to be fair, that's pretty good for Chicago in March. Like I cannot tell you how many days I would roll over in the morning at, when my alarm went off, look at my phone, and it was like negative two. And I'd be like, are they going to cancel school? They're not. Like our, our rule in our old district was like, if it didn't feel like negative 17 or colder, then we still had school. So you were always watching like, does it feel like negative 10? We're really close to like a snow day. So you got you got to uh worry when it's all about feelings because i would say right now for me if it was 50 degrees it would feel like negative 17 right so yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's always i mean i won't lie dave i really love being in meetings with you because obviously with your role for the teach better team we're like constantly in different projects together and one of the hardest things about working with you dave this is the hardest part is that we log on to the same zoom meeting I'm like all bundled up. I got sweaters and scarves and I'm freezing sitting indoors in my office. And you are in like some cool, like Hawaiian t-shirt and like it's 80 yeah. degrees. Well, right? at least I've shifted. If you remember when, when I first moved here, I took all my meetings outside and I've shifted well, cool. now and now I'm indoors just so mm -hmm. I don't have to be so braggadocious about it all the time. That was true. When you used to take meetings, like sitting outside in the beautiful sun. It was 
kind of like a form of torture, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I might have to get back to that. Well, yeah, it'll be fine. I guess I support every so often. I feel like I can live vicariously through you, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, last night I went to my daughter had dance class, and I just went and sat outside for three hours and watch this amazing sunset and watch some people fishing and catching flounder on a pier. It was, it's a hard life I live. Yeah, you live in a painting. It's, it just is what it is. <laughs> morning, everyone. It's so good to see you all in the comments. Good morning to Julie, Nikki. We have a ton of people in our Facebook group that are commenting. Brianne's here. I love it. Dave, I think people are going to be so thrilled to have you live. But I will admit, it's been, a, it's been a while since you've been live with us. Do you mind sharing who you are, what you do? I mean... They all know you, but let's just pretend. Maybe it's a, maybe we have some first timers here for the show. Yeah, you know, that is always the hardest question to answer. Who are you? Like, it, I feel like I just need to sit down in, on a leather couch and unpack Not a lot there. of things. But uh, I'll just I'll share a few things. Dave Schmidt, um, director of leadership and development on the Teach Better team, which means I get to hang out with cool people all the time, like you. Spend a lot of time in schools, uh, helping grow leadership teams, helping teachers with assessment, data literacy. Uh, grading, things like that. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I, I love what I do. Actually, tomorrow I get to pack up again and head to West Virginia and Southern Ohio to hang out with some amazing educators. So uh, love what I do and love the people I get to do it with. Oh, so fun. You have been such an asset to have on the team because people just like, first of all, I love hearing you speak. You have some of the best like one liners that just make you think for, for days and days and days, but also Dave, the work that you do, obviously you can train on the grid method and you do all that stuff, but you are our assessment guy. You're the guy that we continue to lean on when we have those questions that seem to be opening a can of worms. You're my person I go to. So I love when we get into some discussions, because even though I know you have an expertise in so many things in education, leadership, and just like endless topics, I, anytime I want to open a can of worms, I go to Dave Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good because I'm really good at opening them and, and have a hard time closing them, right? I, I love to ask the questions that make people think and wonder and try to figure things out for themselves. So, But isn't that kind of a good role to have? Like sometimes it's one of those things and as teachers do this all the time. We like walk in a room, we kind of stir things up, open a can of worms, and then we slowly back out of the room and sneak out and like let the let the chaos continue. I, I kind of feel like I'm the educational grandparent because of yeah, <laughs> because I'm the oldest guy around. But you know how no. when kids go to grandparents' houses, they get all the candy, all the stuff, and everything just goes crazy, and the grandparents are like, Here, now you deal with it. That I, I kind of feel like I get to do that that same job with for teachers. I get to show up and kind of stir things up, mix things up, and ask a lot of questions and say, Okay. Have fun. The good news is like a, like a good grandparent, though, I don't just say you figure it out yourself. You take care of it. I try to stand beside them and clean up the mess as, as we go. But yeah, somebody's got to stir the pot every once in a while. I love it. I love it. It's so good. Uh, Dave, I know that you don't mention this in your intro because it would just go like forever. But you also have a podcast and you also have published multiple books, many of which they know the people in our comments have probably sitting next to them on their desk or already have in their Amazon account. But if I know this is like picking your favorite child, if you had to pick your favorite book that you've been a part of writing that you've written, mm. I know I'm asking, I mean, I could tell you my answer, but I feel like I was going to ask you first. So good question. They're all different. Um, That's the problem. It's not yeah, like you've yeah. four books that are even on similar topics. Like they're so, all completely different. So I'm going to have two different answers because I can't just give you one. Jeez. One is the process of poking the bear that I got to write with Caitlin Giordano. I just, I loved having an excuse to hang out with Caitlin um, and be able to sit down and just, she and I truly just poked the bear with each other and brought up a lot of great conversations. So any excuse to hang out with Caitlin is a good excuse. But I think probably the one that was most therapeutic for me and actually the one that's given that I've received the most feedback from others has been bold humility. Um, probably not where you thought I was going to go, but uh, Bold Humility is a, it's a book really designed for leaders to, to encourage them to be transparent and vulnerable in their leadership journeys and not to feel like they had to be the person with all the answers for all the people. Mm, so good. No, I'm glad you went with that one because then there's so many more for people to go explore. And like I said, on so many different topics. So friends, if you've not checked out Dave's like Amazon uh, list, <laughs> check that out Amazon. everything back here all of these right these are all the one no not not at all not at all are you gonna but, write another book can you out it right here this morning i know it's only like <laughs> we're nine minutes into the show dave do you have an announcement for us 
Well, uh, not an announcement, but I, you know, I've, I've stated before that we should always be learning so that every 18 months we could write a new book. Not saying you have to write a book, but you should be learning enough that every 18 months you could if you wanted to. So Ooh. it's been, uh, it's been about a year for poking the bear. So yeah, yeah. wait, I really like this reflection though. And I like that caveat that you don't have to actually do it. Yeah. But have you learned enough to be able to write a book? Gosh, I mean, I, I guess my answer initially is I hope so. Yeah. But to actually identify a topic or, or a series of topics that I could say, yep, that would be an interesting book. Yeah. Hard or to, to have some enough stuff written in your notes or uh, on your phone or in a journal or somewhere that you talk to yourself that you could go back and try to put some stuff together so that you could every 18 months go back and reflect on your notes to figure out if you have some sort of theme or something that you could articulate to somebody else. It's interesting when you phrase it that way, I think everyone should be able to say yes, but I think it's a good opportunity to reflect, to say, like, if, if you at any point, which we've all been in these ruts, but if, if at any point you said, Oh, I kind of took a step back from being a learner. I Mm -hmm. think that question could get you back on track without it being intimidating because again, you don't have to do it, but are you keeping an open mind to, consuming new things, I guess. Right. And, and if writing a book seems like a daunting task, right, because the actual art of sitting down and typing things out, writing things out, which now has gotten a whole lot easier, we could just talk it out and let AI write it all out for you. Yeah. But if that is daunting for you, even getting yourself to the place where you could come up with a new conference presentation every 18 months or something along those lines, could you create new content for people every 18 months? Mm. That's so good. See, I know we're going to get into some teachable moments, but I think that's such a special reflection especially at the end of March, because mm-hmm. we're nearing, you know, quote unquote, the end of our school year, which is so arbitrary, depending on where you are and what's going on in your world. But um, yeah, kind of giving us that open door to say, is there new things that we could, should, may want to be focusing on? That's yeah, special. absolutely. You know, Dave, we're going to get into some conversation here with our teachable moment. And if it's okay with you, I kind of want to take this an interesting direction because we have some major news coming out for the Teach Better Conference here literally in just a few days. And I thought that we could use this topic to kind of lead into our discussion. So can we transition to our teachable moment? Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll be right back. Good morning, everyone. We are live for the Wednesday Wake Up Morning Show with the Teach Better team. And I want to continue to echo Brad Hughes in the comments where he's saying he loves to see all the amazing Teach Better family in the comments sharing their thoughts and uh, some links there. Brian Fennell sharing some links, which I always appreciate. We are streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and LinkedIn. So depending on where you're watching, you might see comments a little bit differently. But um, it's always nice when we are able to see kind of who's tuning in with us and what your thoughts are in our discussion. Dave, we are getting into our usual moment and I know that there's so many things that we could focus on, but it's the end of March. I thought we could keep the content light and kind of focus on something I know that you and I are really passionate about putting into our lives, which is educational conferences. So, I mean, this is something that I know you enjoy because we get so much out of going to conferences and I don't necessarily want to focus on the Teach Better conference. I mean, there's some things I want to note about it, But truly, I would love to dive into like, what makes a good conference? How do you know what conferences to go to? How do you find conferences? And I mean, not to spoil it, but like conferences sometimes cost money. Like, Mm -hmm. how do you rationalize that? So that's where I think we should go with this dialogue. No, I I think it's a good one. And I want to put out there, I think you and I at times take for granted um, the idea of, of conferencing and how easy it is. And probably our entire network does, right? The people that are part of this network that are listening and watching this are people that are progressive, that like to learn and grow. The idea of teaching better, you know, tends to draw a certain type of people in. But just last week, I was having a conversation with somebody who lives down here. She actually lives in Alabama. She's been an educator for 27 years, a full-time teacher for 27 years. And then last week, the reason she reached out is because she was attending her first conference, first conference ever. Um, And at at first I was in shock. I was like, what in the world? But then I realized actually she's 
she's the norm. She was she was talking about it with all of her teaching friends, and they were so jealous that she was the one that got to go because they had never been able to go to anything. And I think we take for granted how amazing they are, but it does become that thing beca that becomes addicting. Once you try it once, you realize all that you've been missing out on. And she and I just had this great conversation, and she was so jealous that that I get to go to so many conferences. And uh, we were we had this literal conversation about where where should she go next? What's the next conference she should do? And we had to pee, um, piece out all the stuff that she loved about where she went. And it was Aww. it was good. So don't take for for granted how blessed you are if you get the opportunity to go travel, learn, grow, and meet new people. Mm, such a good reminder. You know, I almost want to say during this conversation, I don't want to talk about the Teach Better Conference because I in no way want this to be like Dave and I just doing like essentially a commercial for why you should be with us this October <laughs> for Teach Better 2023. But really quick, Dave, in case people aren't aware and then they can go explore all they want over at teachbetterconference.com, the Teach Better team is doing a conference. It's October 20th and the 21st. It's in Akron, Ohio. It's going to be a small, intimate conference like always. But more importantly, we are making enormous announcements <laughs> coming very, very, very soon, as early as Saturday, and then again on Sunday, and then every single Sunday for the next five weeks, we are announcing featured speakers and keynotes, mm -hmm. and that will actually lead into our proposals opening for our conference. So as we kind of dive into this discussion here and talk about what we like about unconferences, something some of you might be interested in is who are you going to be able to see at the conference? Who can you learn from? And then also, are you going to be able to share your voice, your tools, your resources at an event? This could be something you look into for Teach Better Conference 2023 if you're interested. So Dave, if it's okay, I kind of want to like put the kibosh. We won't talk yeah. about our conference anymore, but I want to make sure people had that information. Well, that was good. Yeah. Get it out of the way. Go for it. Perfect. So if it's okay, I'd like to start with deciding if a conference is worth your time and energy, mm -hmm. because I think some of the struggle, especially if you don't go to conferences frequently is once you have an opportunity to go to a conference, there seems to be endless lists of educational conferences to go to anything from, you know, national to world conferences to local. And it's really hard to decide where to spend your time and energy, much less your money. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on some, maybe some key pillars that we look at to decide if a conference is worth our time? Yeah. So I, I think it's important to ask yourself or, or to, to consider, are you going alone or with somebody else? Ooh. Because that makes a, a, a big difference for me in terms of which conference I'm going to go to. There are times when I go to conferences by myself and it might be a, a small local conference or a state conference of some sort. And when I go by myself, I can sometimes feel like I'm that outsider. I can feel like everybody else here already knows everybody. Everybody else already has that network. And I feel like I'm on the outside looking in. And the reality, that's not the case. But that perception impacts my ability to shake hands and meet people or, or things like that. So anytime you can, anytime I can, I love to go with somebody else. So I have that buffer. I've got that person that I can talk about the things that I just learned with. Uh, but if you do have to go solo, just keep in mind um, where you're going and how you can actually engage in the conversations, lean in and become a part of the conversations, not just a passive consumer. I really like that. That's kind of related to, but different than making sure you network, right? You're kind of looking at two different things. One is to be able to kind of have a buddy system, which I think is totally something that many of us lean into. The other is with that buddy system or on your own, are you able to engage with people? I think networking is such an important element and when we say networking, we don't mean like so you can get a job next year with somebody else or so that you can follow somebody new on Twitter. But can you find ways to actually like learn from other people that may not have the their the microphone in their hand? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Th a thousand percent. Here's a real story. So 2011, 2012, um, my first time being able to attend AMLE was in Portland, Oregon. And prior to going to, to Portland, Oregon. I didn't have a lot of exposure to the AMLE conference. It's a huge national conference filled with middle level educators. I didn't know what to expect. My district came to me and said, we've got extra money. We want to send you. And I said, free trip to Portland. Let's go. But I went there by myself, um, the other side of the country. And AMLE, it's it's a huge. pretty big conference. There are about 3,000 or so people at, at this conference. And even with that, I still felt so alone. 
right? Surrounded by 3,000 other middle school educators in a strange city, I felt alone. And I remember sitting in a hallway one day. Um, the beauty of going alone is I was able to pick where I wanted to go, when I wanted to go, and think and pontificate. And all. I was just sitting in a hallway. And that's when Rick Warmly and I were able to sit down and have our first conversation, real conversation, because he was there, saw me, and he just struck up a conversation. So sometimes going alone can present opportunities because you can now lean in and have those awesome conversations that you wouldn't have if people thought you're always talking to somebody else. But on the same note, I felt like an outsider until Rick came over and sat down next to me. So just be, be considered of um, how to lean in and how you're going to be able to feel comfortable leaning in. Well, and to that point, Dave, I think it's interesting because sometimes when I go to conferences with people, I find myself not challenging my myself to go have conversations yeah. with people I'm not there with, which again, I love this reflection of pros and cons, knowing what situation you're walking into and how you're going to push yourself. Because I know when you and I go to conferences together, I'm always like, okay, where's Dave? I'm going to go find Dave. Like, where's our next thing? Hey, Dave, or let's go this way versus looking out and saying, okay, who, who don't we know and who can we go meet? And you almost have to find that balance. Um, as you're going throughout the experience. Sorry, right? When I'm at a conference with you, when I'm looking for, I just look for the spotlight because it's always oh. shining on you. And um, I just follow the light and there's Ray. So not true guys. Usually I'm going to conferences that Dave's keynoting and I'm holding his bag. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait. So people I think is important, like networking and yeah. are you going with people? That's something to consider. Another thing, Dave, that I know comes up frequently is like, what's the content of the conference? Because I can only assume as a teacher, especially as an administrator, you don't just want to go to any conference that you don't know that you're going to get actual value out of. One of the things I love about earlier in our dialogue was, have you learned enough in the last 18 months to write a book? I don't want to send staff to an event or even myself go attend an event that then I'm not going to take anything away that is relevant to my teaching ability. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Again, you got to figure out your own niche. I love to go to conferences that are filled with what I call educational missionaries. Mm -hmm. They're not there to, to save souls, but they're there to plant seeds. Um, when I go to a conference, I love to go to a conference where when I am driving home or I'm sitting on the plane, my mind is just spinning with possibilities that I can then take back and, and put into my own place. There are some conferences that are amazing because you go and you get a lot of just rinse and repeat. You can take this and and use it right or you go and you can just feel the rah-rahs and feel the emotional tingles all over which there's a place for that for some people as well for me personally though because of my style i look for those um those sessions where i might be able to learn something that i'm not gonna be able to pick up anywhere else where maybe i'll be able to to see a speaker that i'm not gonna be able to hear anywhere else where i'm gonna be able to get a message that i'm not gonna hear anywhere else because if I'm investing time, energy to go to a conference, I don't want to be able to, to say, well, I could have gotten that same information by reading a book, listening to a 10 minute podcast, um, watching a quick little clip. I want to be able to go where that experience is going to challenge me like no other experience could. Oh my gosh. Is it bad that I think I disagree, but I don't. No, that's perfect. Gosh, I think it's so dependent on where you are at yeah. the time that you're going to the event. Cause Initially, when you were speaking, I was like, oh, yeah, I love thinking. But sometimes when I'm busy, my only time to get some of this like research and consume information is at an event. So like mm -hmm. attending a session that's like, here's how to use Edpuzzle really effectively. Like I could get that in a YouTube video. I could get that in a book, but maybe I don't have the time. And this is going to be like focus time for me to figure out how to use this like one key resource or yeah. I kind of, or like sometimes I'm feeling uninspired. So when I go to a conference, I do want some of that like fluffy rah rah mm -hmm. because I'm maybe not, I maybe I don't have access to that where I'm at in my school. I, so I, I almost feel like it's permission to just make sure you know what you want out of the event yeah. because maybe I only want like 5% of what you shared that you, you're looking for but you want that to be like 80% of what you're looking for. And that either could mean we're going to the same event and picking different sessions, or that could mean we're going to different conferences and then we both benefit. I don't, I don't know. Right. And I think that that's one of the reasons why there are so many conferences to choose from because everybody's got their own taste. And to say that this is the way a conference should be, I think dismisses that, that unique flair. You know, like for example, I'm looking at Julie Soller who's sitting there in the comments with us. 
currently on a trip right now to Disney with her family. And Julie, God bless you for being up this early, finding some you time when a family trip to Disney. Love but it. somebody could say, well, you're spending all that time and energy going to Florida with your family during spring break. Couldn't you have just stayed home and played board games? Well, yeah, you could have. You could have still had some family time at home. But there's something special and unique about making those memories when you go somewhere else. And now you've got those stories that are going to help trigger the things that you're learning about each other. And that's mm. what a conference is about, too. Sometimes just getting away allows you to trigger some new emotional response and some new memories to drive your learning forward. Mm, so good. The other thing you mentioned was wanting to learn from a specific speaker. I yeah. feel like a speaker lineup. I, again, I'm like going to say two things that don't make sense, but like sometimes it really matters to me and sometimes it doesn't matter at all. Like sometimes mm. I don't care at all who's presenting the session. Maybe I've never heard of them, but I love being able to now get to know them. And yeah. that's a benefit. And other times I'm looking through saying, oh my gosh, I get to learn from Dave Schmidt. Like, I really want to go see that session. I think that that balance is kind of interesting as you're reflecting on a conference you might want to go to as well. Yeah, I think that the term educational rock star is probably way overused. Yeah. But I think there there's some truth in the idea that sometimes a conference is like going to see a, a great festival, right? Yeah. Um, where me, I, I will, if I go to a conference and Rick Wormley or Dave Burgess are there, I've heard each of them dozens and dozens of times i will still go because it's like sometimes it's like going to church where you hear the same message but when you go it hits you a different way every single time right and you just need that quick reminder and that's how i feel sometimes hearing hearing a speaker now will i always spend thousands of dollars because a speaker is at a place i don't know but when i get there and that person's there it is a it's a beeline for me even if i've heard them before mm, yeah i really love that finding your own balance in hearing those messages over and over versus hearing new messages from new faces, I think is so special. Yeah. yeah, there's a sweet spot for sure. Yeah. From an administrator lens, I know it takes obviously a financial commitment to send mm -hmm. teachers to conferences. I know the teacher you mentioned earlier, I don't know how she quote unquote avoided educational conferences for 27 years, but typically I hear, oh, it's too expensive to send a teacher to an event. Um, I know that was really big in the district I previously worked in is like, well, I really want to go to this conference. And the first question is, well, what's it going to cost me? Not what are you going to get from it? Not what's what's the take back? It's the, mm. well, what's it going to cost me? So is there some balance here of, I don't know, like everything ha costs money. So how do you decide what to go to? And yeah. and how do you balance that in your budget? I don't, <laughs> I don't so even... again, I don't want this to be a commercial, but I'm going to, I'll, it's going to be a little bit of a commercial, right? I think, one of the struggles with that mindset is that we, we forget that everything has an opportunity cost. Anytime you spend money on something, you're not spending money on something else. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer that anytime you spend money, you need to spend it with intentionality. It needs to serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have a conference coming up in October and we're already letting people know in March allows us to have some intentionality, right? And school budgets typically don't renew themselves until July, which means if you're an administrator right now is the time to start planning for next year's goals, initiatives, strategies. We do a lot of work with districts on strategic planning and making sure that all the dots line up and things are strategic. And you know that when you send people somewhere, they should be coming back and supporting the current initiatives and goals. Right now is the time to say, what are our goals for next year? Where do we want to see our school going next year? And then you start looking for those opportunities for people to learn on how to grow into those goals and initiatives. If everything is a shotgun approach where you just randomly find some things on the internet. And you're like, oh, there's somewhere I can send some people because I've got a few thousand dollars sitting around. You're never going to find the value that you could if you had some intentionality and some purpose behind what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So start now is the time to start thinking about what you're going to do next year. If you're an administrator, put money aside. You don't even necessarily need to know the conference right now, but set some money aside in your budget to say, this is my professional growth money. This is my my uh, opportunity money for my for my staff to help connect the dots. And then when teachers come to you and say, I found a conference, I, I want to go to Teach Better in Akron, your, your conversation can be how much is this going to cost, but it can also be how is this going to support our goals and initiatives? What are you going to learn? What are you going to bring back? And how are you going to grow us? Have that intentional focus. Well, and to that point, Dave, I think as from a teacher lens, if you're going to your administrator and asking for these steps, kind of having some things ready to answer those questions is important. So yeah. many, many, many conferences, Teach Better included, 
will release their schedule lineup way far in advance so that you know what's going to be presented. I think a major red flag of a conference is if they're not telling you what content's going to be shared. And sometimes that's truly just like on the back end logistics. They haven't figured out their full schedule yet. And, and that's okay. That's just, you know, a part of life sometimes. But if the schedule is accessible, being able to bring that to your administrator and have some of those conversations prepped and ready to go could be something that you strategically do. So you have um, some kind of like ammo going into the conversation. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And, and as an administrator, it's again, the opportunity cost. I'm looking at Julia's comments here. I, the idea of having to find coverage for your classroom and write lesson plans, right? Those are some of the opportunity costs that we have to be equipped to, to have conversations about. Yeah. And we have to understand that when a teacher leaves their classroom to go to a conference, somebody else is going to be in that classroom teaching. But we have to know in our minds and in our hearts that the value that they're going to get from being away is going to supersede the, the lost instruction for a day because you're going to be able to grow somebody for years and years and years into the future. Mm, so good. So some things to consider in addition to everything's been shared. When is the conference happening? So do you need a sub? Sometimes if the conference is on an institute day where you, a sub isn't necessary or over the summer, can you can you get that cost uh, rationalized in some way? The other element I know was mentioned earlier, is there ways to support the cost of the event, like doing some sort of grant opportunity? Donors Choose is very popular. Um, sometimes if you speak at an event, mm -hmm. you get a discount for things. That's a huge thing I know at conferences that we're a huge, we're, I mean, I think we're like the biggest advocate for. So like, for example, if you speak at the Teach Better Conference, you don't pay registration because you're sharing your voice and ideas. Um, I personally think that all conferences should be that way. And we know there's not, but typically if you're a speaker, there's some sort of discount that we, we find that to at least be common. So um, that is a way to take care of some of the cost. Obviously, if it's local, if you're driving, that's a way to save some money versus if you have to get on a flight, that's, that's a higher cost. So things to consider there might be some things to bring into that conversation. But Dave, I really feel like educational conferences are essential for educators at this point in the world. And if there's a way that we can support you, I hope you choose to reach out. I know, Dave, you've been to a ton of conferences. Our team is at conferences all the time. Even if you guys want to send us a message to say, hey, have you been to this event yeah. before? Like, these are the three pillars I want to think about when I'm going to a conference. Do you think this conference falls into the three pillars I most value? I mean, those are things that we would love to help with if, we're, if we can. Who knows? For sure. And, and truly, don't be shy about reaching out. I was on a call last night, five o'clock at night with somebody who said, I need to try to convince my administrator to do this thing next year. Can we just talk through and strategize how to have that conversation? Let's do it. I'd love to have that call. Well, it's better to have information, right? Like if you're if you're thinking, okay, I'm, I really want to go. A you mentioned AMLE. I love AMLE. But if you're like, okay, I really want to go to AMLE next year. You know, how can I do this? My three pillars are I want a small conference. I want to be able to drive there. And I want to be able to bring five of my best friends so I can go. I'm not sure that I'm going to recommend AMLE unless you so happen to be in the community that right. AMLE is happening next year. But if you come to me and say, I really want to network, I want to consume middle-level content and connect with middle-level educators, and I want to see a really strong keynote, well, Emily might be a really good option for you. Like, right. That's a great event. So I like that if you have kind of some pillars you're working off of, you can get the right feedback for if it's the right event for you. That's so good. That's so good. So Dave, we're going to head into our community spotlight, which is, of course, somebody in our community that we want you all to connect with and somebody that I think is a great speaker. So you might be looking for his name on the next conference list that you choose to attend. So we'll be right back. Morning, everyone. We are live for our Wednesday Wake Up Morning Show with the Teach Better team, kind of wrapping up our discussion here with Dave Schmidow. We were able to talk through a bunch of different ideas for conferences. If you're somebody who's trying to evaluate either what you're heading to over the next few months or even planning what you're heading to in the fall, um, this would be a great opportunity for you to head back in this conversation if you're just popping in now to try and support the work that you're going into to continue to network and be a learner. 
some of our content here that we get into for our community spotlight focuses on people that we would love for you all to connect with who's in our Teach Better community. Dave, I know you know Jeff Kubiak very well, and we are yeah. going to throw his Twitter up here. For those of you who may not be familiar, Jeff actually came to Teach Better 2019 and has been a part of the Teach Better community for quite some time. And Dave, I'm not trying to brag, but as an educational author, this guy sent me his children's book last night and we read it before bedtime. It was so cute. He, Kubiak is the dude. If you if you if you want a guy that just speaks California, um, who speaks educational ease, who talk about humility, transparency, personal evolution and growth. Jeff Kubiak is your man. This is a this is a, a guy that I've known for a few years now who has grown in so many ways. And the fact that now he's he transitioned and he wrote this this children's book, didn't just write it by himself, mind you. Um, wrote this amazing children's book that is it's so cool. It's cute. It's what it monsters have banners, right? Is that the actual oh, title? Cute. Yes, so he wrote cute. It with his son. How yeah. cute. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's a guy that has doubled down on family and uh he's doing it the right way right now. It's so good to see. Yeah, and I really love connecting with educators that are not only obviously working in the author space, sharing their voice, but an educator who wrote a children's book that is then doing work to, again, just continue to impact children's lives. It's such an incredible book. He actually has more than just that book. He's done a lot of work in education. So he has a lot of different things that you could go pick up, but shout out to Jeff, the work he's doing to support educators and now and continuing the work he's doing to support kids as well. Just a super fun conversation. No, just, just a, a good guy. When you can support good people, doing good work. It's a, it's all takes it to a whole nother level. So I know he pulled up his Twitter, but guys, he's all over social media. Like I know we're connected with him on Facebook. I follow him on Instagram. Like there's lots of places to connect with Jeff Kubiak. So make sure you go follow him. If for whatever reason you struggle to find him on social, just reach out to Dave and I, we can direct send you uh, those links. Cause he's definitely somebody that you want to add to your PLN. If he's not already somebody you're following already, before we wrap up our morning show here, we'd love to give you a morning challenge. So Dave Schmidt, I need you to get in the mode, get in the zen of a of a challenge, maybe opening a can of worms or refocusing our intention as we head into the week. And we'll be right back. Morning challenge time as we wrap up our conversation. Dave, what are we leaving our community with? You know, a wise man once said it's important to focus on the focus. <laughs> um, so I'm going to use that and try to bridge together our conversations from the, uh, from the morning so far. The last week of March right now, I I'm going to challenge people. In the last week of March, if you were to write a book about this year and the lessons you've learned, do you have a title for it? Like spend some time this week to figure out what the title of your book would be for this year. I said, you know, learn enough that you could write a new book every 18 months or come up with a new conference session or something that we could produce some new content. Think about the lessons you've learned, not just the stuff you know, but the lessons you've learned from this past year. Do you have a book title for all the things that you've learned? If not, use this time to reflect, to learn, and figure out what you still want to learn over the next couple of months. <sighs> Can we, can we push them to do a little bit more with their title than just like hashtag hot mess express? <laughs> like, can we, can we challenge educators to go through this process? If you want to take it an extra step further, come up with a really dramatic title and then maybe one that's realistic. Yeah. And, and focus on something that you've learned, not just something that you went through, not just something you experienced, not just the way that you felt, but something that you learned. Ooh. Good. Dave, thank you for joining me this morning on the show. I know typically you're traveling all over. So making it live with us, especially at this early hour is challenging for you. But there has been a lot of things to reflect on. I know it's everyone's going to love the show. It's been fun. And I, I told you earlier, I apologize for, you know, I, I wanted to be able to shine a light on you. I wanted to wear some some mild clothing today so people could just focus on the words of Ray. So if, if my shirt woke you up this morning, I apologize, people. But Go have an amazing day. 
I love it. And if you are listening on Teach Bear Talk podcast, you do want to make sure you head over to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, or LinkedIn just to see Dave's shirt. Uh, <laughs> definitely something you should do because it is it is what you need on a Wednesday wake up. That's what I would phrase it as. There you go. Friends, as a, as a final reminder, wrapping up our conversation, we have a major announcement coming on Saturday and then another major announcement coming on our Sunday show for our Sunday weekly warm up. And then every single Sunday following our Sunday weekly warm-up show, we'll be announcing a featured speaker or keynote for the Teach Better Conference all April leading up into proposals opening in May. Please make sure you join us for that enormous, enormous event that will be happening. Um, Live shows are always fun, but especially when we get to spill the beans on big, big, big news, you won't want to miss it. So we'll see you this Saturday and this Sunday for those big announcements. Bye, friends. See you later. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.